Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, let's get back to the um, to the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, I want to tell you why the second part is true. First of all, so the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one, said that if if a function is continuous. on an interval and a closed interval then if you take another function given by the integral of f up to from a to x where x, x now is allowed to change the derivative of the integral is the derivative is the original function Whoop. The derivative of the integral is the original function. Uh, the, the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus tells you that uh, the, the um, integral of the derivative is the original function. So the other way around. So, um, uh, so we have an antiderivative that's going to turn out to be the integral. So it has to be continuous on AB and the derivative has to be the original function. Then uh, the way you find the integral of F is um, to evaluate uh, the antiderivative. So um, this is saying that the, the integral of the derivative is um, is the original function in a way because of course I could always say um, I could write little f as f prime since they're the same. So here I'm taking the, der the derivative of capital F, and we then we integrate it. So I guess we, if we take the integral of the derivative, we get the the same function except um, that we get this f of a here. Okay, so um, let's let me tell you why the second part is true. So um, we have that f prime is little f, and we want to show that um, the integral of little f is big F. So um, what we can do is we use the part that we already know. So how, how what does this tell you? Oh, well, wow. I didn't turn the page. Oh my God. Okay. So um, we have an antiderivative of a function, and we want to show that the integral is computed by evaluating the antiderivative, like I just said. 
So we used the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. <clears throat> um, you can take this function given by integrating little f and fundamental theorem of calculus, the part one, tells us that um, uh, its derivative is the original function. It tells us that the derivative of the integral is the original function. So with this in mind, um, so what we have We have that <clears throat> both the derivative of G and the derivative of capital F are the same function. So how can two functions have the same derivative? Does it mean that they're equal? I mean, they, they look like it. it's kind of like the if a plus b equals c and b plus c, I don't know, kind of. I didn't understand that. Um, you said something plus c, but I didn't hear the first part. I don't know. I, I, it's like something is like if a plus b equals c and like i don't know b plus g equals c and something like that i'm confused um yeah i'm confused too so what's an example of two functions that have the same derivative but they're not the same So the derivative of x squared is 2x. What is an example of another function that has derivative 2x? That is not x squared. X squared plus one. So the thing is, right? So if you take the derivative of X squared, you get two X. Adding a constant doesn't do anything to the derivative, but also, the only way to get the same derivative is to add a constant. Um, this was a consequence of the mean value theorem. Um, mean value theorem says, Well, implies, I guess. This is not literally what it says. If they have the same derivative, there is some C for which G prime, uh, sorry, G is F plus C. So definitely if they differ by a constant, they have the same derivative, but also 
the complicated part is that if they have the same derivative, they differ by a constant. So, um, so this means, so I can tell you which constant this is because, um, what happens when I take X equals A? So f of a plus c is g of a. And g of a, well, the definition of g is up here. Um, you plug in x equals a. What happens when I do the integral from a number to itself? And into on an interval of length zero. So I'm computing the area of of um, this. I don't know if I call, I can call it a rectangle. So the area is zero. Um, there's no area that fits in there. So this is a, and also, you know what this is? It's also a. Um, the integral from somewhere to itself um, is always zero, whatever the function is. So f of a plus c is zero. So this means that C is a negative F of A. The question was, what was this integral? It's too late now, I'll give you the answer. The answer was zero. So if f of a plus c is g of a, that's just what I'm calling c, the difference between f and g. But here it happens to be zero. Then the difference is always negative f of a, just from solving this equation, solving from c. So now, what happens if I take x equals b? If I take x equals b, Then, um, well, I just said C is negative A, is negative F of A. So F of B minus F of A equals G of B. And, and G of B, you get, you find G of B by plugging in B into the, into the limit of the integral. And that is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to I wanted to say that um, f of v minus f of a was the integral. Where did the negative come from? Because if they sum if they sum to zero to solve for c, I need to subtract f of a. Right? If two plus c is zero, then c can't be two. It's negative two. Do you agree? All right. Other questions?
Okay, so, um, well, now we know how this works. Um, let's do, I guess, the rest of the class, basically, it's going to be examples. Um, So, for example, so when you have an integral now, um, you know that what you have to do is, is find an antiderivative. So, uh, well, finding an antiderivative turns out to be a whole thing. Um, so it's not to sometimes be very hard. Sometimes it's impossible. And, and there's a lot of techniques to do it. And, and that's like, I mean, that's half the concept in Cog2, learning to do antiderivatives. Uh, and so far, the only thing we know is guessing. Um, tomorrow we'll learn use substitution, but uh, so far we have to guess. Um, So I guess an antiderivative. So what has the derivative x to the fourth? X to the five divided by five. Thank you, Shelby. So, uh, what has the derivative x squared? X to the three divided by three. And what has the derivative one? X. So um, finding it requires guessing, but um, checking it doesn't. You just take the derivative. So the power rule says that here I'm going to get 5x to the 4 divided by 5. Here I'm going to get 3x squared divided by 3. Here I'm going to get 1x to the 0. Uh, which is x to the fourth minus x squared plus one. So we, we did do this correctly. So to find this integral, um, we, we just take this function, evaluate it at three and then at one and then subtract. So that's gonna be one fifth minus one, no, three. So plug in three, uh, and then subtract and then write brackets because if you don't, uh, everything's gonna go wrong. And that's it. Um, I'm not, I mean, to expand that, but doesn't, I don't care at all. All right. So, um, this is basically all, all the rest. Um, so let me tell you, so let's move on. Um, I mean, move on to 5.3. 5.3, 4, 5.4, uh, but it's basically the same topic. Um,
so um one thing so you might have noticed that i haven't used any symbol for the antiderivative i haven't i just i've been saying in words capital f is an antiderivative and i guess i've used capital letters um but uh the thing is the symbol we use um is an integral So um, we we use um, we use an integral, um, and notice that we don't write bounds. Well, if we don't write bounds, what we mean is uh, an antiderivative. Because the only, I mean, before, before, right now, I've never said what this symbol means if I don't write A and B in the, in the endpoints. So this is any, or sometimes, I guess you could say all, because since there's more than one antiderivative, you always have to worry about that. Um, Um, the functions that have derivative, whatever, um, taking the indefinite integral off. So this is called an indefinite integral. Um, but the word indefinite integral, that's the word we people usually use, but it means exactly the same as antiderivative. So it's not a new it's not a new concept, it's just a new word and a new symbol. Um, so, um, so now there's two very similar looking things that are kind of, um, that uh, are not the same at all. So, um, well, I guess not before that. So for example, I would say the indefinite integral of x, I would say is any function that has derivative x, like x squared divided by two uh, plus a constant, the indefinite integral of sine is negative cosine, just because the derivative of negative cosine is sine, and so on. I guess this is really need a plus C here because this is not, this is not a question that has one answer. It's a question that has a bunch of answers. Um, the integral of one over X is the logarithm of the absolute value plus C. Oof. I'm already forgetting the plus C. So really you shouldn't forget the plus C, uh, but we'll see how that goes. All right, not to take it for granted. Um, so this and in indefinite integral and the integral we've been talking about the whole time
or not the same thing. So um, this is an indefinite integral. So now I guess now I might call this one a definite integral, what I've been calling integral the whole time. Uh, and the, the big difference between them is that this is a bunch of functions. It's all the functions that have derivative f. This um, this is an area. This is the area of uh, the area um, what was I saying? Um, this is the area under the graph between a and b. Um, so it's a number. So they're very, very different. One of them is a function or many functions, a function with a C in there. And the other is just a number. This um, this means three or five or negative 10. Uh, this means x squared over two plus C. Uh, turns out when you plug in values into here, so when you, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you want to compute this number, you compute it by plugging in b into the indefinite integral, then a and subtracting. So once you plug in numbers into a function, you get numbers out, and then you subtract them and you get a number. <clears throat> okay, any questions? Okay, so the question now is how to compute antiderivatives. Um, and the answer is pretty hard. Um, so, um, so one way um, one way is to guess um, so um, basically everything you know about derivatives tells you something about um, tells you something about integrals about indefinite integrals and therefore about definite integrals as well uh, every derivative you know is is also an integral if you go the other way. So you know that you know the derivative of tangent is secant squared. That automatically tells you the indefinite integral of secant squared. It's tangent um, plus whatever constant you want to add there. Uh, you know that the derivative of arc tangent is one over x squared plus one. So that means you know the integral of one over x squared plus one. So um, if you basically, if you want to compute an integral that appears in this table, um, then you then the answer is in the table. What if you want to compute an, an, an integral that is not in the table? Well, then, uh, well, who knows? So, Gal2, in Gal2, you spend at least a month just doing everything we know that helps us compute integrals. And still, once you do everything that humankind knows, I mean, there's 
there's things there's integrals that we know to be impossible uh and they're not even they don't even look that complicated the thing is um i could take like this function And I would make you take the derivative with no remorse at all, because it would take you a while, but you would get the answer because you just have to apply the rules until they get to the end. Um, the integral, on the other hand, who knows? Um, when you start writing random functions, what happens is that they turn out to be impossible. Uh, so what happens if you try to take a random integral. Um, so this is what happens. You go, so this integral is impossible. Um, so what you do is uh, you, you give it a name. For example, this one happens to be called the Fresno S integral. Um, these names are not at all important. Um, I mean, I, I guess, I don't know. I've never run into the fractional S integral in my life. And if you if you end up in a line of work where this is very important, you'll eventually learn it. Um, but basically, every time, every time an integral comes up that you don't know how to solve, uh, you, you invent the name. And then you, since you gave it a name, you pretend like you know it. Isn't that what knowledge is? Uh, if you try to do the exponential, so here, this is just e to the x squared. This is maybe negative. Um, this integral is super important in statistics because this is a normal distribution. And this function is called erf. Erf is the error function. And well, the main thing we know about it is that it's the integral of this function. Um, I mean, I could just start guessing. Um, probably, I mean, just start writing random functions. They're not going to have integrals that anyone knows. Cool. So the, the integral of sine of e to the x is called a sine integral. Look at that. Um, I know this one um, also has a name. The thing is Wolfram Alpha. But, oh no, sorry. Ooh. That integral I should know how to do. Uh, this, called, this is called the logarithmic integral, whatever. Um, I mean, no one in any calculus course is going to make you learn these. Uh, but what you have to keep in mind is if, if you ever in your life need to use them, you can look up their properties. They're just every time, basically every time you have an integral that you can't do with the functions you know, you've discovered a new function, I guess. Um, anyway, you have a lot of computing integrals ahead of you, especially if you take code two. Um, so, but today let's um, stick to the guessing thing. So um, so what happens if you try to um, take the integral from 0 to 1 of secant squared? So what happens is that, um, you know, um, Um, you know that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus says um, 
this is uh, the tangents of one minus the tangents of zero. And since we do this evaluate and subtract thing, as you can imagine, we do it all the time from now on. We just, um, we write it concisely this way. Um, you write a function and you write either a line or a bracket and you write zero to one. So this means, uh, well, it means evaluate and subtract. And I guess I have no better tangent of zero. So the sine of zero is zero. So this is, um, this is um, tangent of zero is zero, but tangent of one is just tangent of one. Um, that's the, it's a decimal number. I don't know what it is. Um, when you write um, this, it means evaluate at the top, at the top number you write, Evaluate at the bottom number you write and subtract. Um, so, for example, since so we don't because we don't want to write the fundamental theorem of calculus thing every time. We just like to solve the problems in one line. Uh, if I write x squared minus two evaluated between zero and three, this means plug in three, plug in zero. And subtract. So you will get um, nine. <clears throat> Any questions? What does nine? Mean? I don't understand that question, Matthew. What does nine mean? Do you mean? I mean, if you're asking why did I write nine? Right. Um, so say you want to um, do another example. Um, control between one and two. Uh, x squared minus two divided by x plus four divided by one plus x squared. So one thing you know, because it works for derivatives, it works going one way, it works going the other, is that you can if you can do derivatives and sums in whichever order you want. That means you can do integrals and sums in whichever order you want. Um, so taking an antiderivative of this sum is the same thing as taking an antiderivative of each of the three terms and adding it together. So an antiderivative of x squared is x cubed divided by three, and then um, we need to find an antiderivative of negative two uh, divided by x. That's the same thing as taking an antiderivative of one over x and multiplying by the constant. So constants also come out of um, of integrals just because they come out of derivatives. So the question becomes, well, we are finding area, but the way we're doing it is finding definite integrals. Um, 
so this is an area um, you grab this function. So um, It's at x squared minus two divided by x um, plus four divided by one plus x squared. Um, so we are finding the area under this graph. The thing is, we don't have to. We don't have to draw it. Um, no, one and two. It's one and two. We're finding this area. Um, but the thing about this area is that we don't, the thing about finding areas is that we don't need to draw a picture ever anymore. We only need to, the, the way to do it is to find an indefinite integral and, and plug in. So what is, um, what is an indefinite integral of one over x? What function do you know that gives you derivative one over x? Log x. Um, or if you wanted to work for the negative numbers, um, log of the absolute value of x. So one way to do this is to look at this table for log x, which is one over x. And we don't, I know I don't need to write c here because any c I write is gonna give me the same answer. So just pick the easiest thing. And now I wanna find an indefinite integral of one plus x squared. So I wrote one plus x squared here because it happens to be on the table. Um, here you go. It's the arctangent. One over one plus x squared um, by some magic happens to be the derivative of the arctangent. So all we need to do to find this area is to um, evaluate this at two and at one and then subtract. Uh, so this is evaluated at two. So I guess the absolute value of two is just two. Um, evaluate at one and subtract. And make sure to subtract everything and not just um, the first thing after the brackets. Um, and I'm not going to simplify that because I can just, I mean, put into a calculator. I mean, this is, this is zero and the arctangent of one, the angle it has tangents equal to one is pi over four, but I don't care. I'm done. And that answer is the area. Yeah. That answer, whatever you end up getting when you plug in, uh, is the area I just drew. Let's see. So this looks, I would guess this area is something like two and a little bit. Um, plug into your calculator, see what it says. Two log two plus four arc 10 of two minus one cubed divided by by three minus two log one, which is to zero, so I guess four arc 10 of one, two, two point two. This, the, the red area does look like 2.2 .2 to me because it looks sort of 
if you look at this two by one rectangle, it looks like this is slightly bigger than this, but not that much. Um, so it looks like it's a bit bigger than this rectangle. And it is, we got the area. I mean, one thing you gotta be careful of is this works if the function is continuous. If you try to find the area between here and here, that's not gonna work, but you are gonna get an answer by doing the indefinite integral. It's just not gonna give you the area because there's, there might be, I mean, who knows if there's infinite area here and here. Uh, that's another talk to topic. But yeah, we did do the area without having any clue what the function looked like. I mean, we didn't, we didn't use it at all. <clears throat> okay, um, so there's a thing, lastly, there's a thing that the book calls the net change theorem. And it's really just a fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, the net change theorem says you take the integral of a derivative and you get, um, and you get uh, the difference in the function. So, um, I mean, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, if I have an antiderivative, I mean, it's really the same thing. Um, F is an antiderivative of the derivative, it's derivative, of course. So the definite integral is going to be f evaluated between a and b and subtracted. So that's just f of b minus f of a. Not, nothing new, it's just that this way of thinking. So if you, if you look at it this way, this is um, the integral of f prime of x, the integral of the instantaneous rate of change. Um, and if you look at this, um, at, at the other side, this is the total change. The difference between B and A the total or the net change, because it could be positive or negative, I guess. Um, So I guess one problem that derivatives had is that they tell us the instantaneous rate of change, but they don't really, knowing the derivative in principle didn't tell us what the total change is. Like, you know, the speed of a car at every moment, you don't really know how far it's traveled just from knowing the speed uh, at every moment. Because for that, you want to know the average, the average velocity, but this tells us the answer. The answer is the integral. Um, so if you know the instantaneous change in anything, you know the instantaneous change of uh, the price of a thing over time, the change over a month, the difference between the price a month ago and now is the integral of, of the instantaneous change, and so on. I'll do more examples tomorrow. All right, and that's it.